Okay, I'm going to speak a little bit about um, the message of grace and hard times. Because, I mean, so many emails that we get and, and um, questions that we get is, is about hard times. Uh, Christians going through hard times. I hear, and, and um, I also get a lot from the United States, people that watch there, and they're going through hard times. I think compared to Zimbabwe, not hard times. But compared to what they were used to, very hard times. Uh, somebody spoke to me from um, Canada yesterday, it was the day before yesterday, and she said to me that they are bulldozing down the new houses in the United States. That's not completed in building. They just bulldoze them down to try and repair the house market, to give value to houses. They just bulldoze it down. All these new complexes, those massive complexes, just bulldoze it down. It's on the news. So there's really, I mean, more than 500,000 people lost their jobs. You know, so it's really going tough. And now we preach the message of grace. And even in our own lives, we believe the message of grace. And what happens if, if, if things don't go the way we think? You know, um, I've, and, and I said there's basically three areas in life where people struggle. You know, I know there's more, but three basic. Family life, health, and money. That's the three. And most people struggle in that area. And then, of course, you get your... Uh, and I believe that's a, 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 that can be a, as a result of spiritual understanding of the Word of God as well. We're just going to look at, at what Jesus said. And so many times, and through the prosperity teaching, you might say, Matthew, you, do you say you're not a prosperity preacher? Um, if we take the category in which prosperity stands in, as to what is preached on television, no, I'm not. I'm not that type of a preacher that promises you God's going to move the heaven and earth for you if you just give your money. No, I, I'm not one of those. What I do believe is that we do prosper in a much higher level than just finances and that, it, that we can also prosper in our finances. I'm not a, a poverty preacher. I don't believe Jesus was a, a preacher of poverty. Uh, the, the Bible says God will meet our needs. And what need you have, that need God can meet. If your need is to be a giver, and you want to even give to a ministry, God can meet that need. If your need is to, to, to have a house, and your kids must go to school, God can meet that need. You know, but um, so many times in Christianity we think that we are of heaven and we are in heaven. No, no. <laughs> the Bible says we are not of this world, but we are in this world. We're not, so many times we think we're not of this world and we're still in heaven. No, you're still in this world. Guess what? If the fuel price becomes 15 rand a liter or like in Zambia a while ago, 30 rand a liter. The Christians also pay 30 rand a liter. <laughs> and the greatest faith preacher also pays 30 rand a liter. That's just the way it is because we live in this world. And how do we handle this? What do we think about God? What do you think about our relationship with God when it comes to these... Um, you keep prime seat. You can't even cry. Amen. Welcome. Uh, what does God say about this? What should we think if we go through hard times? Will we get out of it? How sure can we be that we're going to get out of it? Matthew 13 and verse 18. It's the parable of the sower. It says, therefore, hear the parable of the sower. Now, this is the explanation of the parable of the sower. You remember that some seed f fell on the, uh, on the road, some fell on the stony places, some fell amongst the weeds, and some on good ground. Okay. Now, it says, therefore, hear the parable of the sower, or the explanation of this parable. When anybody hears the word of the kingdom, and he does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away that which is sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. So the person that receives seed on the, on the road is he that um, doesn't understand the word of God. He hears the word of God and he doesn't understand the word of God. Now that, is, that happens in a lot of churches even today. People hear the word of God but they don't understand the word of God. I remember some of my old messages, you know, I'll preach God is a God of love, but if you do this wrong thing, then you're going to lose your salvation. You know, so uh, I heard the word, but I didn't understand the word. And therefore, 
the world could not bear any fruit in me. And I don't say that I didn't have good deeds in my life. I had very good deeds in my life, but the origin was not a revelation of the cross. The origin was a revelation of hell and fear. And that was what brought forth these holy works and good works and commitment and all those type of things. And also, uh, I mean, the, the, the origin of the, the good things I've done was teachings like, um, was actually a desire for more. I desired more, therefore I've submitted so that I can be promoted. So the submission that was in my life was uh, born and founded out of a desire to have more, not of a revelation of what I've got. So the word was not bearing fruit. But if you would look at my life, you would see there's fruit. But that fruit was not God's fruit. It was an imitation of the real thing by the willpower of man. And that is not <laughs> what God has intended for us. He's given us a much higher life than that. He's given us a much higher life than try and like I said so many times, fake it until you make it. And then once you make it, then you can give God the glory. You know, we, we, <laughs> we don't work like that. Right, so it says, let me read verse 19 again. But when anybody hears the word of the kingdom, and it does, uh, it does not understand it, that would understand, there's, there's two words, for, the, the Greek and the Hebrew word for understand basically means the same thing. It means the ability to take something apart, and to put it back together again. So if you understand how a car's engine works, you will know how to take it apart and put it back together again. Um, like with Vessel and I, we did this cru crusade in Hermanus. Now, so I've got this generator, and it hasn't worked a lot. I bought it brand new, and then the needle and seat in the thing got stuck. Now, I've never stripped that generator in my life. It's new basically. It's, well, it's not new, it's as good as new. It's two years old, but it hasn't worked a lot. So the thing got stuck, and then um, we, wh what we need to do is, when you switch it off, you must close the little, f the, the flow of, of the fuel. Otherwise, it's going to flood. So we forgot to do that, and when we want to start the thing, the engine didn't want to turn. But what happened was, it flooded so bad, it filled the whole piston. So I couldn't dry now, it was full, full. So I pulled the thing, it doesn't want to go, the electric start, it doesn't want to go. But because I've got an understanding, with my father we worked on cars, I know how the thing works, I've studied that in school, um, it was my interest for a very long time in my life, I knew exactly what happened. I said to a vessel, just take the spark plug out, it's flooded into the piston, just pull it, the petrol will come out. Then I knew, you don't start the thing now, you've got to put new oil in, because that oil is now mixed with petrol and you're going to seize the engine. So, because of the understanding, I know how this thing works and how to put it together. So, it's the same thing with the gospel. When we understand the gospel and we see hard times or things like as, look as if they break, then we know how to put this thing together again with the gospel and the good news. Now, I didn't all my life had a teaching what happens if, if a Christian goes through hard times. But when there's hard times, then we can take the gospel <laughs> and we can see what the gospel provides for us. Amen. Now I want to tell you, if you're in the gospel of grace, just to get a little bit ahead of myself, you are the best equipped person on the planet mm. to go through a hard time. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> now that doesn't sound like this big faith preaching. But let me, let me tell you something. If, if you can offer me 500,000 rand right now as a gift for free or patience, I'll take patience. Because the 500,000 will get finished and then I'll be impatient. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be <laughs> frustrated. You know, so there are certain things that God gives by His Spirit that makes it easy for us to go through through, through such certain situations while God is busy sorting out the thing on your behalf. So I'm not saying we're not going to get through. But while God sorts it out, we can have joy. 
But what I found in my life is because of a wrong understanding of the word and a wrong way of measuring success, when I was going through a hard time, I was judging myself. Because I always knew this, that a successful, and I, I can only talk out of my own life now, preacher, is somebody who walks just right, he talks just right, he even sweats just right. <laughs> you know? And his clothes is just right, his car is right. Before a meeting, he doesn't talk to anybody, he just gets up on the stage, he preaches, and then the people that helps him take him to his car and he leaves. To his big house. Because he's blessed of the Almighty. That was, that was what I was taught through years. Now it wasn't said in such a way, because that will sound rude. It was said in a much more glamorous way. You know, if, if, if that is said in a deep enough voice, you know, you can believe it. <laughs> so I, I, I believed that. And even after I got into the gospel of grace, there was a mindset, a belief system that still wanted to measure. I want to measure myself according to a wrong standard. Um, two days ago, three days ago, uh, uh, a, good, a guy, we became good friends now, a guy from Singapore, phoned me that also got a hold of my website and the message just touched him. And um, he said to me, Bertie, he's also a businessman, he said to me, Bertie, now when, when it comes to finances, you know, and uh, we were just talking about finances, and I said to him, you know, we, one thing I know for sure, what the Bible says about money is not to trust in the uncertainty of riches. We cannot trust in the uncertainty of riches. That thing is not certain. Like I said this morning in the live broadcast, I said, money is so unstable that people make money out of the instability of finances. Yeah. Called the stock market. <laughs> it's up and down, up and down. And then some people are just clever enough to know when it's going to go up and down. That's how unstable this thing is. So how can we take such a thing that is so unstable that millions of people make their income out of the instability of it, make that our measurement of success in the kingdom of God? We cannot measure that way. It's like Francois says, he says you cannot measure temperature with a ruler. You cannot measure success by what you own, what you drive, where you stay, or if your knee hurts or not. Now, I'm not saying that you've got to be poor and a beggar all your life. I believe God prospers us, and we can work, and we can have a job, and we can pay our things. I believe that. And I also believe that there can be healing for us. But if it should happen that I, am, that I feel sick, or that I um, don't have money, or that my family life is going through a hard time, I mean, one of my friends is going through a divorce. Does that mean God's changed his opinion about him? No ways. There's one friend of mine is going through a divorce. So another guy from that town phoned me and said to me, basically told me how bad this guy is. Now, I know what he does wrong. And what he does wrong is the things he did wasn't good. And then he said, what should we say to him? I said to him, let's ask God. <laughs> let's ask God. What God says about him, then we say what God says. Because if we don't do that, we might just make a mistake. And God sees good. And God speaks good. And God loves. He, he, he keeps no record of what is bad. And He always confirms who that person is in Christ. Because a, a, believing that is the only thing that's going to change his life. Sometimes we get to a place where we've messed stuff up. And we need God to help us to get out of that situation. But I've come to a wonderful key in the Word of God. The way out is the same way as what we got into the Gospel. The way we get into the Gospel is the same way we get out of our trouble. And it's the same way we stay in a good relationship with God. And that is simply having knowledge of what Christ has done for us and who we are in Jesus. Amen. Right, so when, when we understand the gospel, the guy that does not understand the gospel is the person that does not bear fruit. Paul also said, I preached in, Paul preached in a way, the Bible's in the book of Acts, that many believed. So there's also a way in preaching, a way in sharing the gospel. 
that can bring great faith to people, that they can believe and understand the gospel. If I come to you and I tell you, listen, um, uh, uh, Jesus Christ loves you. So I tell you that Jesus Christ loves you. And what you need to do right now is believe that he loves you and get your act together. Do you know what you might, that might change your life to a certain degree, but it, it brings you zero understanding of the gospel. And it's in the understanding of the gospel that the gospel will bear fruit. The vision that we have as Christians is not to, to now listen to this, this might sound, sound a bit shocking. The vision that we have as Christians is not to try and change our lives to a holy life. That's not the vision. The vision is not to try and change my life to a holy life. Although the fruit of the gospel is a holy life. But our vision is not to see how can I change this and live a holy life. Because Muslims can get that right. People with a strong willpower can get that right. Like my sister. I mean she's got a very strong willpower. If she decides she's going to lose weight, I feel sorry for the weight, but she's just going to lose it. <laughs> That's it. It doesn't matter. She's just strong-willed. She will, I, I saw her once crying. You know, she, she'll be hungry or something, she'll cry. But she's not going to eat. She's losing weight. And the same way we get people out. Some, I see some lady say, give me a gift, give me that gift. <laughs> Can I have a dose of that? No, it's not available yet. <laughs> I like what Vessel said. He said, you know, the more you get in grace, the more you realize that um, self-will is dying. Yeah. You know, we, we, we got offered a, um, a television station that will broadcast over S uh, South Africa and Europe, or Africa and Europe. And... Um, so, but the thing, I mean, it was a very, it's a very complicated thing, the, the way this thing works, and I, and I want to use half an hour to explain that. But um, if, if it didn't happen that we could postpone this thing to get enough grace preachers, then we would have to get a couple of guys that preach the law. Now, then I'm not going to do it, even if it's given for free. You know, I mean, if a station gets given for free, it's 750,000 rand. You know, so and the opportunity to preach, you know, your good news message as much as what you want, all over. But I can't allow one. I, I can't. You know, in my heart, I cannot do that. But because of an understanding of the gospel, I, I don't have to measure my success on do I broadcast there or not. And um, a wonderful thing happened. We, uh, we well, they're busy negotiating with these guys that we can only start in January. So that gives us en enough time to get enough grace guys together, you know, to start a grace-based station over, over Africa and Europe. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, that, that's, that's awesome. And that is what, I believe it's what God wants. But even when such a big thing comes, if, if my understanding of the gospel was wrong, I cannot make a, a, a right decision concerning that. Because if my decision is high and big and everybody is the success of God, then I'll fall into that like this. Yeah, well, a little bit of law, we'll work it out. Don't worry, you know. But when you understand your value, then it doesn't matter if you have that or not. That doesn't matter. Um, your joy is not even determined by that. A, a station doesn't make me happy. What makes me happy is when I see People becoming happy when they receive the gospel of grace. That's what, what brings true joy. Amen. So let's go to, um, to Matthew 13. Again, it says here about uh, the understanding. We preach in a way that many people believe. If I don't preach, I, I can come and, and, and tell you, do this, do that. It will not bring understanding. Verse 20. But he who receives seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. For when tribulation and persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. So it doesn't say, if persecution arises. It says when. 
Because somewhere in your life there's going to be something that challenges the word that you believe. And the greatest challenge that I've seen these days, and I, I believe it was like that all the time, is in how it goes with you in this life according to the worldly standard. Because if we don't measure up to the worldly standard, what happens? We feel that the gospel we believe in doesn't produce and doesn't, doesn't work. But it works. Amen. Because at the end, I've seen it so many times, you know, they can, they can, they can be a dip in life. It's like this good friend of mine, I've testified about him many times. He's a farmer. He's farmed um, from the town that I came from. And he was a millionaire, you know, for a very long time. And when that year, the price of onions, and was in a time when he moved from one farm to another farm, it's very expensive and all that. And that year the price of onions went down from, say, 9 rand a bag to 2 rand 50. Some of, some of the bags they gave him 25 cents. Now that is less than the bag that the onions, I mean that bag costs a rand or whatever. Then you must still put onions in there. And you must farm the thing. You know, and he had sometimes 900 people working for him at a time on the field. So, he, to make a long story short, he lost it all. But thank God that he got a hold of the gospel of grace and he understood the gospel of grace. Because going through that time, there was times when it was difficult and he would phone me and I would pray for him and encourage him in the gospel. But now he's farming for another guy. And God is so faithful. He's also farming vegetables. And that's what he did there. And he's doing a wonderful job. He, he, he sent me the pictures of what he farms. Man, I tell you, it's export quality. All of it. It is so good. You know, and what God is doing is He's restoring His farming ability and what He believes about farming. And He saved up about 40,000 bucks now. And He said He's going to get one hectare in a year or so and then He's going to start again. Once He's done that one hectare, then He's got His own business again. So God's going to pick Him up and God's busy picking Him up. But while He goes through that because of an understanding of the gospel, the thing doesn't put him down. But his biggest challenge and my biggest challenge in helping him was this worldly measurement of success is only this big thing. Now I'm not preaching and saying, listen, expect bad times tomorrow. What I'm saying is, if bad times happen, it's not an indication of God's approval on your life. It's not what it is. Amen. So, <clears throat> And, and there, there was a point that I touched on, and I just feel I must just explain it better. I said the vision we have as Christians is not to see how can we change our life from sin to living a holy life. That's not our vision. Because different religions can get that right, strong world people can get that right. But what we need is to, to a normal person to come to an understanding of the gospel of grace have the being of God come and indwell you and God live who God is inside you. So when we preach a gospel, when we read the Bible and, and, and we get into a difficult situation and we see but we don't measure up to, um, to a, a spiritual standard, you know, I'm always angry, I'm always bitter, I'm walking with fear in my heart and all of that. Willpower is not what's going to change the thing. What you need to do is take the gospel of God's unconditional love and just study the thing. Let, let me just talk a little bit practical in my own life. You know, when I, there's also times in my life when I look at a thing and it, it doesn't look as what I've, I wanted it to look. Like, I mean, I've prepared now for two, two and a half days, three days to get this thing together that I want to show you guys now. And now this thing, look at the wires there. <laughs> so I, I open the laptop, I'm excited. Vessel says, before you take the thing out, just look there. <laughs> it was not a carrier of good news. <laughs> it was not the gospel. Well, anyway, so, so well, I, I couldn't, I, I can't do it. But, so these things sometimes, it's a small, small thing, it, it, I can think of this now, ah, oh, well, that's nothing. But now, 
I come home and I switch something on there that must work and it doesn't work. And three days from now I start the car and the starter breaks. And then this happens. And then that happens. Then those things start to preach now. Yeah, now God's talking to you, you know. God tries to say something. And the first thing is introspection. God, what have I done wrong? It's like, you remember I told you long ago, it's like making, uh, 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 planting watermelons next to a squatter camp. And then say, God, what's wrong with my life? They are stealing. <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with me. There's something wrong with them. There's nothing wrong with me. They're stealing. I'm not stealing. I'm providing you. So in the same way, so many times we are, we, I've realized, you know, that the devil attack old cars. <laughs> He does. Old cars. He attacks old cars. I haven't seen him attack the newest Bentley or a brand new Mercedes. He does, you know, and the cars that's built well, he doesn't like to attack them as well. The strong cars, like if you buy a Land Cruiser Bucky, you know, the devil doesn't so much attack that thing. <laughs> But you can buy some make that you can't even pronounce the name. That thing, the devil attacks those things. <laughs> and then we say, God, what's wrong with us? Just, just look at the logic, you know. And our measuring system is, I measure the success of the cross on how reliable my vehicle is. We can't do that. It's a wrong understanding of the gospel. It's a wrong understanding of the gospel. If you want to look at your success, the Bible says we must look a little bit higher than this world. It says in Colossians 3, let's read Colossians 3. Lorraine said I preached too long, so I'm always over now. So you can complain with her. Lorraine said you have to get Okay, somebody said... <laughs> <laughs> but I must say why she said I, I say so many wonderful things that she can't she can't do alles verwerk nie so well, you wonderful man <laughs> oh he's a blessing Lauren. I'm not I'm sorry I, I word nie so vinnig afgesit I preach until I'm finished amen right Colossians 3 listen to this if then you were risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not the things of the earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. So if you want to measure your life, you take the life of Jesus... And you measure. I can't use the... I, I remember, man, when two years before we moved here, we, we said we got blessed with some money. We said we're going to buy ourselves a nice fridge. And we bought this fridge, a big thing. Man. And just before we got here, just after the guarantee. Yes. <laughs> to make a long story short, I think they're putting... They're using it for a cupboard now. It's, uh, it, it broke. But we cannot, we, we, we had to leave it there and get another one down here. But, I mean, we, how can I base my spirituality and my relationship with God and my righteousness on Calvinator's ability to build a fridge? I can't do that. That is wrong. That is wrong. But Bertie, will we never prosper? We'll get to prosperity in how we prosper. Because I do believe that there is a place of prosperity. And there's a place where God can warn us before the time and we can hear the voice of God. But we cannot 
through situations measure, measure who we are. We have only got one life. And I tell you, this scripture has blessed me so many times. Because look at your life. Set your mind on what is in heaven. To Christ, who is your life. Now listen, if I tell you Jesus is your life, that means you don't have any other life, but the very life of Jesus Christ. You cannot assign any success to your name outside the success of the resurrected Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father. For He is your success. He is your life. Hallelujah. He is your innocence. He is your righteousness and your holiness. He is your glory. He even says, the Bible says, when He returns, you will appear with Him in glory. The Bible says when He comes, we will be like Him, for we will see Him as He is. For what we see is what is in us. So what I see there, when I see that full glory manifestation, I will be transformed right into that. I'm talking about immortality and those type of things. Amen. Now the fact, let me put it to you this way. If I sit with a receipt here, and that receipt says, I've got... Uh, a million rand in the bank. I don't have to have the million in a stack here to be a millionaire. <laughs> Isn't it? I don't even have to use that money to be a millionaire. The fact that it's in the bank and that I've got the receipt makes me a millionaire. So the fact that Jesus is in heaven resurrected with a brand new life, not a normal Adam life, but the life that he's resurrected into today, and that that is my life, and I've got the down payment or the proof, which is the Holy Spirit that indwells me, makes me the righteousness of God. If I never make use of it, it, never, it doesn't mean it is not like that. If I've believed on Jesus, received the Holy Spirit, even if I have not made use of, a, 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 of it in an area of peace or an, an area of finances or um, long-suffering or whatever, it doesn't mean that I am not that. I am what He is. His life is my life. I don't have any other life. Hallelujah. Now, when we... When we go through those things that the fridge breaks and this happens and that happens and whatever, you know, then you feel in your heart these things start to preach to you. Now, you've been listening to the preaching of the world for, say, a week. The fridge preaches. The car's gearbox preach. The bank account preaches. The shoes you wear preaches. The, the relationship between you and your husband preaches. And it preaches all the time. It is when you're in the situation, when you get in the car, you see the, this thing or when you, whatever problem you have, you see it. And then you think and ponder on that thing when you go home. So now that thing starts to work in your heart. Isn't it? That's why Paul would come and he would write. He says, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Meditate upon those things. And let me tell you something. I I've seen it. See, you might mark your quart, ne? Now, <laughs> it only happens to some people. He says, a builder. The builder that made him angry has forgotten what he's done and he's still angry. <laughs> now, I don't, now, what he's done, I think he must still remember it. Okay, but you, you, what I'm trying to say is somebody can do something, you get upset. Now you walk with that thing in your heart. When you start to think of it, think, think on how it works. The more you think of it, the more you want to think of it and the more you think of it. But it works the same way with the gospel. When you think of it, the more you want to think of it, and the more you think of it. Because that's the way God made us. Amen. I'm not trying to say, well, force yourself now, meditate upon the scripture. What I say is, is when you experience this joy, like you go out here, you'll experience joy. Oh man, there's good news. Bless God. You know, when you feel, I'm thinking of good news. Man, take that Bible, read a scripture, put in a CD, whatever. 
and you'll find your mind continually start to meditate, meditate on this good news by itself. Where it comes to a point where you can't wait for your next thought. It's true. It's true. When a situation comes, if I look at my own life, and I'm not saying I'm getting everything right, but when a situation comes, I can't wait for the thought of grace concerning that situation. Because it's good. Amen. That's what happens. And you start to live in a place where you're almost untouchable. Now you say, Barty, how will I ever get there? You can't get there. You are there. Just wake up. <laughs> See. Because that's what Christ has done for you. That is your life. Look at Paul in jail, singing. Listen, I've been visiting people in jail. I must use my words. <laughs> visiting people in jail. And you know, when you walk through those doors... I mean, Andres, they also visit people here at Paulsma. When you walk through those doors, you hear cuckoo. And then you're in a little thing like this with a little small window there. And you think, when are they opening the next door? And then they open it up and cuckoo. And it's about 10 doors to get to the other 10 doors to get to the guy. It's really like that. And cameras and everything, you know. It is not nice. I, a, a friend of mine, I went to jail and I visited him there, a farmer. And I, I said, you know, when I went there, I said to him, now when do they let you go out of this thing, this, this cell? Now he was in a, like a maximum thing. He beat somebody up. So he had to go there for two years. And eventually just went there for a year. And he, and he was in the cell and he said to me, you know, I'm allowed half an hour a day. Half an hour a day outside that and then when you get outside it's a small place twice the size of this room with walls four times as high you can only see the blue sky there you can't see a tree <laughs> you see nothing he says the first time he got out there that he saw a cat it was the most beautiful thing he's seen a cat <laughs> now Paul was not in a luxury jail like that he was in a jail 2,000 years ago, man, where they had no mercy, had no value on a human life, where they kill you for the fun. They put him in the stocks, and he starts to worship God. Now, let me tell you something. To do that, you need a different understanding of the gospel. You can't do that out of the, the understanding that we've been brought up in this Western world. And I said before I came here, after the message this morning, I said, Lord, the preaching that I have, the vision of this preaching is not to see, you know, how many people we can get happy in one day. The vision is that people can understand the gospel of God's unconditional love, have a re revelation of that, and stick with that until the day Jesus comes. Amen. 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 And not prom I'm not going to promise you the newest BMW tomorrow. What did he say? Okay, I'll promise you that, but you're not going to have it, and then you can come here and hear the gospel of grace. <laughs> what I do believe is that you can be blessed, but the measuring, the way we measure, is if I get something, I'm happy. You know, God is good. But if I don't get something, I'm not saying God's bad. Because it's good. There's a level of goodness that's so much higher. You know, it's like um, if I take my wife. We, we married now 14, almost 15 years. We did mission work in Africa together. I mean, with, with my sons, it was small, poor, struggling, everything. She did, man, she, she gave me her whole life. We did everything together. And now, for me to say that she's not good if she doesn't make me a cup of coffee, there's something wrong, man. There's something wrong. I hope you hear what I'm saying, because what he's done is so much greater 
than measuring it in a worldly system that fluctuates all the time. We sit in a more stable system, a kingdom system. The life of God is ours. And let that be our reality. That's what Paul says. Let that be our reality. Amen. Amen. Now, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom, of verse 20, but he who receives seed on the stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, and yet has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation, that is Matthew 13, oh, Matthew 13, 20. He only endures for a while and then he gets offended. Now, what does that mean on stony places? A stony place, the way I see it, the Bible says the law was written on stones. That is when the law is still in your belief system. And you hear the gospel of grace, but your belief system by which you measure it is the law system. <laughs> and the law system is, if I do this, then I'm going to get this. If I do this, then I'm going to get this. Now I take the grace system and I base it on the law system. And the moment something happens that doesn't make sense, it didn't work out of, I've done this, now it doesn't work. That's when people get offended because the foundation is a law system. I've given 500 rand, I didn't get that other money, so God's not a provider. Says a man with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Provided with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the very nature of God. The kingdom of God is inside him. Isn't that awesome? A man like that can say, God is not a provider. I've done it. I've done it before. I mean, I've the Holy Spirit, the power of God, praying for the sick, seeing miracles, seeing people getting saved. And, well, God doesn't provide. That is, the measuring system is a law system. Well, I've got these do's and don'ts foundation. The root inside me is the law. The root inside me is not the grace of God. When the grace of God message is the root inside me, my value is measured in a completely different way. Do you know that the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul, if he would have lived today, <clears throat> he, wouldn't, he wouldn't even have been recognized by the church outside. He, he would only be seen as a troublemaker. It's really like that. Paul was a troublemaker according to the church. He walked where he wanted to be and only had one church that supported him. Twice. So it would have been the same today. But the most wonderful thing is Paul was not this big shot apostle. According to the church standards then. Although he spoke to the poorest and he spoke to Caesar. He spoke to people, God did take him places, but he was not the guy that always speaks to the delegates, delegates of, the, of, the, of countries and only speaks to kings. And, no, no. Today he speaks to the king. Do you know why he spoke to Caesar? Because they wanted to kill him. He was in jail. <laughs> so he appealed to Caesar because if he didn't appeal to Caesar, then the Jews would have killed him in Jerusalem. So he made a plan. I appealed to Caesar. A higher court. So then they couldn't kill him because if they judged him in Jerusalem, they would have murdered him right there. So he said, I appeal to Caesar. And then you were allowed to appeal unto Caesar. So he did. Because of the case, it was a life and death matter. So they, he, he got free. And then he lived in house arrest. And I mean, that at least gave him a bit of liberty to preach. Now I'm not saying we should live those lives. Because the, situ the situation today is a bit different concerning persecution and those type of things. But listen, man, um, the gospel we believe, the grace gospel we believe, is also got enough power to take us through onslaughts in life. Which comes? And if, you, if I tell you it never comes, when it comes, and it will, then you will always think, well, I've sinned somewhere. There's something wrong with me. Whatever. If they double the price of electricity now, they're talking about raising it. If they do that, what have I done wrong? Nothing, man. I'm in peace there at my house. Minding my own business. 
And they come and raise, <laughs> just raise it. Now, when they've raised it, now what now? Especially if you, if you get a salary, you know you're only getting 10,000 rand a month. That's what you get, and you've got to put your kids through school. You've got to, you, you, I mean, you said maybe you're not even married. What now? That means you've got to cut somewhere else. But what we have is we've got a father. We say, Father, thank you, you know, that you provide for me. God works in the heart of your boss, or something happens, you know. Yeah, something happens. People bring you money, whatever. Somebody invites you to go and eat with them, and you make it up. God does it that way. It's just the way God is. But I can't measure now and say, well, now, because, because I've come short now, God, there's something wrong with me. Let me look at these shiny preachers that say, you got, I'm going to get all this money when I give. No, no, that's not the way it works. The root inside our hearts is supposed to be the gospel of grace. And that bears much fruit. Amen. That bears much fruit. And then he goes and he explains it in a different way. He says, there's seed that's sown amongst the weeds. Which is the curse. It speaks also of the, gospel, of the gospel of the law. You know, because all these weeds and thorns and thistles came up after Adam's fall. And then there's some seed that's sown there. It is, well, I plant the law and I plant grace. And I plant the law and I plant grace. And I can't bear fruit. So a law mindset breaks down the fruit that you need to have. Amen. Let's go to uh, James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Now I'm going to explain a scripture here to you that's going to bless you now. It, verse 1. And this is now like bringing the balance, explaining to you how God provides for us. It says, James, a bondservant of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now I always said, God, <laughs> count it joy. I mean, there's something wrong. You are telling me when the bad time comes, be happy. And then, let's read the scripture on, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work. So now, the way I always understood that scripture is, when you get into hard times, you better be happy. <laughs> when you see a hard time, be happy. Then God will help you. Now that's not what that scripture means. <laughs> Count the joy when you go through hard times. The way I see this, if we read on, let's read on. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into different trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So what's the end of the thing is, perfect, complete, lacking nothing. So yes, there's provision. But there might come some times. Let me give a good example. Um, I think it's in Matthew 24, 26. Jesus warns the people. He says, when you see the enemies of Jerusalem standing around them to make war with Jerusalem, speaking about the destruction of the city, Jerusalem, uh, 69, 70 AD. He says, leave all your stuff and flee to the mountains. That's not speaking of end time sometime. It already happened. Leave all your stuff and flee to the mountains. You know what Rome did? They burnt Jerusalem. All the stuff of the Christians, they burnt it. And the Christians that didn't flee, they died there and they were also burnt. Now, <laughs> the guys didn't sit there in Jerusalem and they said, well, I'm a Christian. They'll burn everybody, but they will not burn me. <laughs> no, no. God gave them wisdom beforehand. And that is why it is very, very important to have the gospel of grace as a foundation in your heart. If you don't have the gospel of grace, which, now I want to define this, which doesn't find its measurement in what you possess in this world, you'll be able to hear the voice of God. Now let me tell you why. Because God, 
listen, if I am uh, a guy that only believes it's always going to go, go well, then I will not be able to hear when God says, listen, there's a depression coming. How will I hear it? It can't be the voice of God. But now, since I'm in grace, and that doesn't mean anything to me concerning my value, I'm open to hear that. And God says, listen, there's a depression coming. There's a hard time come. So, save up for this, or do this, or do that. That we can hear. Amen. So, when you've got grace rooted, I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. When you've got grace rooted in our hearts, we can hear. You know, God says, listen, um, I, I don't want your son to go and do this, or listen, your son will get hurt over there. You can hear it. But if you're not in that, and everything I do must always be blessed, well, my son's now going to go there, or my wife's going to go there, and everything is now going to be blessed, thank God. You cannot hear what God says. You cannot hear what God says. I mean, before this recession came, to, uh, came I just felt in my heart, and I, I said to... Um, to one of my friends in business, I said, scale down, brother. Scale down. He's in the building business. Scale down. But if you're not in the gospel of grace, you cannot hear scale down. You cannot hear it. Maybe you're in a business that's not supposed to scale down at this time. You know, and you'll hear God say to you, go for it. But the foundation from where we hear is the gospel of grace which doesn't find its value in what you possess, what you wear, and where you stay. But in who you are in Christ. When you're in that, you can hear what God says. I wanted to do a crusade in Natal a while ago. A guy invited me to come and do this crusade. And it would be a big crusade. Now, I want to do crusades. And then she said, Bertie, we must do this thing now. You must come. You must... And I just felt in my heart not to do it. Now, I don't know what the reason was, but I just felt no. And I said, let's move it to April this year. April came. I just felt in my heart still, no. And then I felt a thing in my heart that is the right thing. And that is, this guy will organize smaller crusades. Not a crusade that's going to cost 150000 but that will cost 10000 and we'll take our equipment up there, leave it there, and he'll organize the crusades, and we'll do smaller crusades, you know, in areas where nobody go. And now I feel peace in my heart. Yeah, we can do it. But if I was just success-driven, listen to me, I had, I had a law mindset that says, much is of God. I wouldn't be able to hear what I'm hearing that produces peace in my heart. Amen. So I want to encourage you, let's understand the gospel. The gospel is not a gospel that says, much is always of God. One has got the same value as everybody. And everybody's got the same value as one. For one was given for all. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So here it says, um, it says, count it all joy when you go through various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith will produce patience. So, when, and this is what I want to tell you. Listen, when you see a hard time come, you don't have to worry. Because the faith that is inside you, this is the way this is supposed to be translated. The faith that is inside you possess the power to work in you what is needed to take you through and to the point where you lack nothing. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. That makes us, as grace Christian believers, fearless in this world, knowing we will always receive the promise that God has promised for us. I'm not saying we are going to be poor. I'm not saying we must be sick. I'm just talking about the whole context of this is a situation where you find I'm going through a hard time now. Or you see this is going to happen. It's like my friend. You know, I wish I understood the scripture the, uh, this way when he started to go through that hard time in his business. And I could see in my mind, man, he's not going to make it. man. But I don't know how to say it to him. It's difficult, you know. I wish I understood it this way, that I could say to him, listen, it doesn't matter what happened. The faith that's inside you can, has got the attributes to produce what's needed in that time to get you to the place where you will see the manifestation of everything that you've got no lack and that you're perfect. Amen. 
Maybe you're sitting in a, in, in a situation where you, um, I mean, I don't know all of you, you, you go through a situation where you, you might go through a divorce or you might, your child's sick or your child's on drugs or you, you're just in a very bad situation and you see something coming and you, you know it's coming and you've prayed about it, you've, you, you did bind the devil, you cast the devil out, you spoke blessing and the thing's happening. What now? Listen, the faith that you have inside your heart. Now, uh, uh, this morning I read the scripture another way. I said, uh, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith will produce patience. Now I want to put it in a different way. My brethren, count it all destruction when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of a law faith only produces more destruction. If you understand what I'm trying to say. The context here is true faith. What is faith? Faith is the persuasion of who I am because of Christ. That's true faith. That faith has got the power to produce the patience you need in that situation to go through that situation and see the outcome of God while God organizes the thing. Because God is at work on your behalf. Let's look at uh, uh, Philippians 4. Philippians 4. You know, when I think of it this way, it gives me so much peace. It gives me so much peace. Well, maybe you've got some deal coming your way or whatever. You don't have to be afraid. Go into the thing, man. Go. When you go, you will find that your faith has got the attributes and the character to take you out of it if it's not supposed to be there. And if you're in it, and even if a mistake was made, that the thing is not working, you can still have so much rest because the faith that's inside you possesses the power to take you through and see you blessed on the other side. Amen. So we can rest in this gospel of God's unconditional goodness. The end is always blessed. Amen. Hallelujah. Philippians 4. From verse... Let's read from verse 8. I hope you don't... I trust that this encourages you as much as what it encourages me. The, the, the more we realize who we are, the fruit of, of that faith makes hard times lose its power in our lives. It's powerless. I can't feel condemned. You know, <laughs> I, don't feel con I don't have to feel condemned because of what happened to me. The worst thing, listen, say somebody comes and now he steals from you. Now you feel, oh, they broke in, they stole. And then they steal again and again. Now you start to think, God, what's wrong with me? Why don't you protect me? Where's the angels? Where's this? It happened to me. So, I don't have the answers for all of that. But what I do know is that the worst thing that can happen to you is people to steal three or four times in a row from you and then you start to feel God's upset with you. That's even worse. It's much worse than people stealing from you. Thinking there's now something wrong with you, going into introspection, going into... Uh, 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 Thinking what sin do I have in my life? Going to try and think, God, what causes the separation between me and you because of all these things? That's worse. That's worse. The only test we are allowed to test ourselves and see is to see if we are in the grace of God. See, are you still believing the grace of God or did you become law-minded? That's it. Let's look at Paul's life here. Now, I don't want you to please hear what, and, and this is a practical example of what happened in the book of James. It says uh, from verse 8, Philippians 4 from verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, and whatsoever things are, um, I mean, am I right? Are of good report and of virtue. If there be anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Now, what, he, what he's saying there, 
the way in which they spoke was this way. Meditate on the good things. When? When you go through the hard time, you meditate about what God says about you. I tell you, if I go through a hard time, there's no sweeter words than my wife come and tell me, Bertie, you're a wonderful man of God. You know, you're the blessed of God. You've touched many people's lives. And, and say the things that God sees in me. Now, I know those things. And it's sometimes just good if somebody else also says that, because sometimes you think you're the only one that believes it. Amen. And that's how we encourage each other in the Word of God, speaking the very Word of God. Like, I've, like I said, this one friend of mine, he would make me upset, you know. He will do things that's just stupid. Messing up his own life. Then I think, now I'm going to tell him. I pick up the phone, then I bless him. <laughs> I bless him. So my brother, I want to tell you, you're the righteousness of God. You know what you've meant, what you've done. And, and he, he supported my ministry greatly. I said to him, the way in which you've supported my ministry has touched thousands of people's lives. You know? And God will never forget that. That's what God, in the book of Hebrews it says, God cannot forget your work of love. I mean, God is not a God that takes account of the wrong. He takes account of what His Spirit has done. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And that's just the way God is. That's how God speaks. That's how I meditate upon all these things. Um, now, let's go to verse 10. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but lacked opportunity. Now, it talks about finances here. These people supported him. They normally well, they supported him before. And, now, um, and then they didn't get an opportunity. Those times it was an opportunity was, I mean, they had to get all the stuff over there. It was not just money. They, they needed an opportunity. People to take the things there. Okay, and was difficult for them. It says, now that I speak, in, not that I speak, listen to this, this is a great key. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am to be content. So why didn't he have any need? Was it because he had stuff? No, no, because he had contentment. <laughs> now contentment, patience, long-suffering, they are synonyms. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. So what he said here is that in the Spirit, because of my mind, my mind is set into this awesome revelation of who I am in Christ and the awesome word that I speak. You know, if I come to somebody, I like what uh, we were in Zimbabwe, Francis said such a beautiful thing. We were, um, he was on the back of a bucky. Um, traveling from one place to another place because he missed the bus. So the guy that was with him was a, a well-known, he is a well-known soccer player, and he does business like that. You know, he would get a truckload of stuff and take it from the one place to the other place. And then this guy was also on the back there, his truck and stuff, but also riding on the back. And then he said to Francho, now, who are you? He says, no, I'm Francho the toy. He says, now, what do you do? He says, no, I'm a, a, a preacher, preach the gospel. He says, now, where do you preach? And they tell him he preaches everywhere in the world. So the guy said to him, now, what are you doing here? Mm. On the back of this truck? He says, I'm placed here by God for you. Mm. That's why I'm here, just for you. Beautiful. God takes the best and puts it here for you. Mm. Now, you can't measure. I mean, that's a different value system. The value of a person. Getting kingdom minded. When Jesus came to this earth, He was mindful of people. He was mindful of giving them life. And I want to tell you, church, the life of God that's in you is what, what God, that is God's plan with you. And measure yourself by the life of Christ. Yes. Amen. And when you start to get that mindset, the fruit and the attribute of that is called contentment. You're just happy. You can't, listen, contentment cannot be faked. You can't even try. Just leave it. You either have it or you don't. And don't even try to get it. Now how will I have it? By just see, seeing the, the simple truth. And you'll find that fruit in your life. So Paul said, I am rich. Why? 
Because I have learned to be content with whatever I have. Amen. Now listen to this. And now I, 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 uh, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Abased also comes from the word abused. Okay? Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things, talking about rich and poor, through Christ who strengthens me. Yes. I've got the strength to be happy when I'm poor. Oh. <laughs> Now, well, I know, listen, man, I know m many people don't want to preach it that way, but that's what stands there. I mean, can I change what's written there? That's what's written there. Now, I, I, to get one's mind out of our, a, a Western mindset, sometimes it's so difficult. To try and change your mind in that, is, you can almost like leave it. I didn't know these things. I didn't know these things. After years of studying the gospel, I started to see it. And I tell you, you I'll rather have contentment. Now I know God prospers me. I know. I mean, we are another thing that I forgot to tell you guys. I've been invited to preach on Zimbabwe's national TV. Half an hour before the six o'clock news in the morning. <laughs> Amen. And you know, I don't pay a cent. A Zimbabwean pays it for me. Now let me tell you, that's a miracle. That's a big miracle. And God just opened that door. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, so I'm not saying that God cannot open doors. I'm not saying we can never speak to kings or a nation. We can speak to a whole nation. But our value is not, is it a nation or is it one? Our value is the life of Christ inside us. Amen. For everybody and unto all of man. Amen. So here Paul comes, he says, listen, I'm so glad. Now listen to, you might say it's got mixed emotions. He says, I'm so glad. That you gave to me. Not that I speak in respect of want. For I am content. Now you might say, is contentment a mentality that says, well, I'm willing to sit with poverty for the rest of my life. No, no, that's foolishness. Contentment is just joy. doesn't matter what. <laughs> that's it. It's peace that surpasses knowledge. I like what Andre says. He says sometimes he's got so much peace that he stresses because he's got peace where he thinks he's not supposed to have peace. <laughs> well, look at this. Well, I need... Uh, Lord, look at this situation. I'm not scared. But look at it. And I don't worry. And this guy, he phones me from... Um, it was so wonderful. He phones me from Mauritius. So he's also a businessman. He said to me, he was a millionaire a year ago, and now he's got nothing. I don't know if I testified last time about this. So he said to me, <laughs> he said to me, he doesn't, he's stressed because he doesn't have enough money to buy food until the end of the week. Now he's in the hotel business. Now with the economy and hotels... It doesn't go that well. Food is still okay. People need to eat. But hotels, you know, you're going to first cut there. So um, you're not going to go on vacation and whatever. So he's stressed. And he's listened to all my teachings on finances. So he says, Bertie, I've listened to all 12 of your teachings and some other stuff that you preach. I've done it all. And this is my situation. I said to him, there's just one scripture you can stand on in this situation. And this is it. Look at the birds of the air. <laughs> they don't sow or reap or gather into bonds, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Yeah. And you, my friend, are more valuable Amen. than birds. He phones me again. He says to me, <clears throat> the Friday, he says, I want to testify. <laughs> I want to testify. I used my, his words was, I used my last pennies to go and buy food. He says, then, I don't know if the guy 
saw, saw him in the shop or phoned me. He says, oh yeah, I forgot, I still owe you money. For a long time. I just want to pay you. He says, yeah, man, what a blessing. And then he got some money. He says that he can live for a, a month or whatever. And he was so blessed. He said to me, I, I had more joy in this than in the deals of millions. Because it was born out of I'm valuable to God. Do you see the difference, man? <laughs> it was not, well, I'm a good businessman and I've sown, because he was heavy into the sowing and reaping thing, you know? And it's, it's like my wife said, she said to me, Bertie, why, do, I can say it now while she's out. She says, Bertie, why do we always meet the businessmen once they're poor? <laughs> I said because the <laughs> I said because the other gospel cannot comfort them. God cannot help them. Amen. Can't place value upon them. That's why God brings them here. So that we can preach the gospel to them. They can have self worth and live and go on in life. Hallelujah. So this guy phones me and he said to me, um, and he's happy. I said to him, What happened? He said to me, You know, we got a there's a business deal coming through of millions of dollars before the end of this year. So he was going through that. But in that, he said to me, when he had those cents, he said to me, Bertie, this is it. I shared that scripture with him. He, the, the, the day after that, he spoke to me again. He said to me, the, whenever I feel I stress, I go and I read the scriptures and I feel a peace that I cannot understand. And that's what Paul was talking about. And don't listen, church, don't underestimate that. That is a gift of the Almighty God to help you to cope and to go through while He's busy preparing the way for you. Don't think, well, I feel peace, but nothing's changed. No, no, it says, let patience have its perfect work. So stay in that, man. Enjoy it, live in it. Hallelujah. Then He went on and He said, not I, that I speak in respect of one, because I've learned to be content. I know how to, I've, I've known how it is to be rich. I've known how it is to be poor. He wasn't ashamed of that. Paul wasn't even ashamed to say that he's poor. Where to us is a disgrace to say you're poor. What value system did he have to write a letter to a church that he knows will be circulated? And what wisdom did God have to make Paul write this that people can read it for another 2,000 years? We are ashamed to sound poor. Because they, it meant nothing. Okay? I can do all things. Nevertheless, you have done well that you've shared in my distress. So he said he was in a distress, but he had peace. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed to Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving. But you only. For even in Thessalonica you sent twice, once and again, for my necessity. Not that I, not, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. What he's saying is, what I'm actually seeking is to see how the gospel of grace works in your heart, that generosity can flow forth. And now I'm seeing the generosity as a result of the gospel of grace. And that's what I always wanted to see. Not that I wanted the stuff. If they gave to somebody else, Paul's joy would have been the same. Because it is the working of the gospel of grace in their life. And then he says, um, but you've done well in sending this thing. So he was talking in such a way that the people almost thought they'd done something wrong in giving to him. He said, well... I thank God that you gave to me, but not that I was in need. But I thought you were suffering. Yes, I was suffering, but I wasn't in need. Why? Because I've learned to be content. I can live this way. And I know how it is to be rich and to be poor. Christ strengthens me, so I haven't placed any demand on you to do it. But I'm so glad to see the fruit of the gospel of grace working in you now that you've sent this. So how was it sent? It, it was a fruit of the gospel of grace. So giving is definitely part of the fruit of the gospel. It's not wrong. But forced and it's received can maybe buy the preacher stuff, but it's not the fruit of the gospel in your life. And there comes a time when, when, when that fruit comes in your life. When you say, well, I just, when contentment, listen, 
the greatest thing that I believe that can come financially to the body of Christ in the spreading of the gospel is for the church to be content. Because once you're happy with what you've got, you'll have left over to give away. Amen. But as long as what we've got, a greed-orientated gospel, where we say, we'll take your money to, 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 to supply to your uh, uh, lustful stuff, you will always live with greed. You'll never be set free from greed. You always want more and want more. And we can't use the want to motivate you to do something. No ways. Paul didn't do that. He said, I'm happy with what I've got. I'm happy the way I live. And I thank God for the fruit that, I can, that, that, you, that, that you send. And then he said, it's a sweet-smelling sacrifice unto God. Now, the only sacrifice that was sweet-smelling to God in the Old Testament was that which spoke of Jesus. So their giving spoke of the work of Christ, working in their lives. Amen. And that changed Paul's situation. So here we can see Paul was in distress. While he was, he had. Then he was in distress. When he was there, in that time he had peace, and God did work in the heart of a church <laughs> to give, not on the basis of um, condemnation or guilt, but on the basis of a fruit of the gospel of grace. And those people gave, and Paul prospered again. So I want to say to you, if you go through a hard time, there is prosperity for you. But don't let the hard time teach you and tell you that God doesn't love you, God doesn't care for you, you're missing, missing it in 20 places, and all of that. If you're missing it anywhere, say you are missing it somewhere, the only way you're going you're gonna to get to the place where you're not missing it is by having knowledge of the truth again. So just stick to the gospel, man. Just stick to that simple gospel of God's grace. Then the Bible says in James 1, verse 12 and 13, that if you go through this hard time, you know, and know this one thing, that it's not finding its origin in God. It doesn't find it in God. It says, for God tempts, tests, tries, and scrutinizes no one. And the greatest scripture people use on testing is Abraham. Abraham was tested. Yes, because Abraham had to qualify. <laughs> in the same way Jesus was tested and tempted in the desert, led by the Holy Spirit, to qualify on our behalf, so that we are qualified now in Jesus' name. Amen.